I'm so excited uh, today to be speaking with, is it Karu or Karu? Karu, yeah. Karu, okay. Uh, Leo Karu about one of my all-time favorite series, the Under the Northern Sky series. I've talked about it at length on my channel, and I've talked about it in my words, but I'm excited to hear Leo Karu himself introduce himself, as well as how he would describe his own books. <laughs> Um, so yeah, my name's Leo Crew, not Paro, as the audiobook actually has it. Um, and I am the author of Under the Northern Sky, which is the trilogy you've got very well displayed on your bookshelf behind you there. Um, and yeah, it's basically a sort of, uh, it's a trilogy which imagines that more than one species of human survived the Ice Age um, and lives in a kind of alternate version of Dark Age uh, Europe called Erebos. Um, and they set up different societies and kind of um, there's a fairly major conflict which plays out between them. Um, and it was originally inspired by a sort of, uh, well, I wrote it for the first time when I was 12 years old, um, quite soon after learning to read, which I was very, very late. <coughs> and um, then went off and studied biological anthropology as my degree and sort of that like developed a lot of the ideas that I'd had originally. Um, and then finally revisited it when I was sort of, I think, 20, 23 and living in a tent in the Arctic, which gives you a lot of time to think. Um, it was 24 hour darkness and I've been there for about sort of six months already. Um, and conversation more or less run out with the two blokes I was living there with. And um, yeah, just went back to that story I'd written when I was 12 and then rewrote it. And that's um, what Under the Northern Sky ended up being. And also in... Uh, my spare time moonlight as a military doctor. Just, Just casually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I imagine um, 12 year old Leo's idea for this story was probably quite different than what it ended up being. Yeah, it was much more um, <clears throat> like a much more how you'd imagine a 12 year old would write fantasy. Um, well, I can't imagine actually. being 12 and conceiving of this series, so I don't know what, <laughs> what 12 year old you <laughs> thought it would be like. Um. Yeah, it was much more like sort of, I think what I wanted to do is just write about battles, essentially. Um, and uh, I think probably there may have been a tiny bit of it originally inspired by the elves from Lord of the Rings, because like the Lord of the Rings films had come out fairly soon before that. And um, I was sort of interested in that thing about alternate species of human and kind of um, really liked wilderness, even at that age, I was obsessed with trying to get out camping and things like that. So I think in my head those two sort of fused and I just sort of started developing this kind of like weird uh, alternate universe which I used to think about on my way to choir. I thought it was really helpful being bored you'd sort of you know back in the days for audiobooks and like iPods and things like it was so all you had to do was like let your thoughts run away with you and I just imagined this story and actually part of the reason I ended up writing it down when I was 25 was because I was stuck thinking about this even when I was in my 20s um, like every night before I go to bed I'd sort of think about like a new part of the story and sort of how this bit would go and like um uh part of the reason of trying to get it published <clears throat> was because i just wanted to get it out of my head and <laughs> stop thinking about it basically fair enough fair enough well there's a lot to the story and i have a lot of questions as you know um <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get through a few um but for anyone who's interested you do also have a blog where you've uh talked about um in particular the anakim which are that, well, they are very different from elves. So if elves were your inspiration for the Anakim, yeah, they come along right. Yeah, <laughs> you went quite differently with them. But uh, so I, I, I'll try not to ask too much about the Anakim that is already answered on that blog. Yeah. Um, so I'll link that down below for anyone that wants to read it. Um, but and then I, I have I've read the whole series, so I would do want to ask some spoilery questions. But I'll save those for the end, so that if anyone has read, uh, well, not read it at all, or read the first or uh, a couple of books and hasn't read the third one yet, you can still watch the beginning, and then we'll talk spoilers at the end. One of the things that I love so so much about these books is the world building. So I have a lot of questions <laughs> about the world building, uh, and in particular, um, a feature that I think becomes more and more uh, prominently featured in the series as we go is the Cryptea. Um, so. <coughs> I know I sent a lot of questions about sort of the origins of the name for them and in how you went about creating that 
element of the story? So the crypto was probably one of the most uh, sort of organically evolved elements of the story. They kind of, in the original version of the book, um, for anyone who hasn't read them yet, they're like, uh, they're this organization of behind the scenes um, assassins, effectively, who <clears throat> are embedded in the Black King Kingdom, which is the Anakim society. And their job is to safeguard the power of the Anakim monarch, the Black Lord, <clears throat> or rather say, stop them abusing their power. And they do that by uh, basically giving you a warning if you've gone too far and then ultimately assassinating if you continue to go too far. And they, the name Cryptair is from, um, as I think you know, from the like, <clears throat> the Spartans had a sort of secret organization which used to go out terrorizing the helots who are this like under underclass of slaves that they used to rule over and who used to basically do their sort of farming and things for them and like make their, uh, uh, they'd sort of devolve the like business of subsistence to them so that they could train exclusively for war. And it was just, I literally took it from them partly because, you know, sort of shadowy organization and partly because crypto is just too good a word to waste. Like crypto just sounds sort of like, you know, unhand, a bit sneaky, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> and they started originally as like a group of assassins who were kind of more at uh, the Black Lord's command. So they'd be able to use them to like kind of root out their enemies. But when it came to actually writing down the story, it just became apparent that that made the monarch too powerful. And you'd end up writing a kind of um, story much more about a despot who couldn't really be challenged in a way which I think got a bit gets a bit boring and like there's not enough checks on their ambitions. <clears throat> and actually there's there's something quite challenging about writing about the actual monarch of a regime because there aren't really enough people to like stop them and kind of uh, there aren't enough um, factors thwarting their ambitions and what you really want is a good challenge, don't you? So the Cryptia had to change into a more kind of antagonistic role because otherwise I think things would have been too easy for Roper our main character. Um, yeah. Reading the beginning of The Wolf, I wouldn't say Roper would agree that he has things too easy with or without the Cryptia, yeah. <laughs> but... I mean, for the overall series, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Force to work against him. And then why um, a cuckoo as the symbol for the Cryptia? Yes, yeah, so they've got, they made it quite heavily on the branding of the um, they leave, They're leaving their cuckoos everywhere all the time. And it's, bas it's basically just because uh, the Anakim are incredibly in touch with the natural world. And they sort of, they would think of everything as like, um, how does this relate to some element of wilderness? And cuckoos uh, famously sort of like, go into other birds' nests and will lay their own eggs in place of the other birds. So they will trick the other bird into trick into them raising the cuckoo's eggs and young as their own. Um, and it's kind of, it's like an open uh, brag from the crypt here, essentially saying that like, we can insert our own person into your institution and there's nothing you can do about it. Like you will raise them and your, fun your like institution will function to raise our candidate as its own and you won't even... You can't stop us, basically. <laughs> well, we like um, accuracy and branding. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're all about the branding. Then I did originally want to ask a lot about the Unhiru, but um, <laughs> I know you said you plan to post about them on your blog as well. So I don't want to waste too much time on information that I'm going to get anyway. But uh, if right. you want to tell us a little bit about the inspiration for the <laughs> Unhiru. Yeah, the Unhiru. Um, so basically, the Anakim is sort of uh, like the the model species of them is like is the Neanderthal essentially, um, because they're the like species of human we know the most about. Um, so I thought it was like most interesting to use that kind of as our like model species to work out like how you can make a, a version of humanity which is really different to uh, us modern humans. Um, <clears throat> and then the Inheru I took as my baseline uh, Gigantopithecus. You've ever heard of it? It's like a um, it's like some very fractional remains of I think they only have a jaw of a, a massive, uh, probably the biggest of the great apes, basically, which is now extinct. Um, and I just thought that was really fun to like have a, a base, an entire species of like what we know, which is not very much, basically you've got a sort of like vegetarian, enormous um, ape, possibly sort of related to hominins, but maybe not. Um, and then you could just, from being massive and being vegetarian, you just extrapolate loads from that and kind of, see where that would take you as a society um 
and quite often they're likened to chimpanzees as uh, orangutans as well because they're like thought to be the nearest um in terms of the, like the jaw structure so they also drew quite a bit from orangutans too um i will like i'll like delve uh, quite a lot more into that when on my blog post but um yeah no that was the basic sort of idea and then like lots of wild extrapolations from that basically i imagine the sort of grooming that they do comes from what we've observed of what <laughs> apes do yeah exactly like chimpanzees and sort of um uh that's probably one of the less subtle flights of fancy i think <laughs> it worked because uh it had a sort of job of the hut feel almost to it as well but also in keeping with yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's quite <laughs> that's true i didn't know about that I hadn't thought of it until this moment, but I was like, what does it remind me of to have a leader that has this sort of like, I don't know, women around him grooming him? Yeah. <laughs> uh, as you yeah. Um, just now talked about with um, regard to the cuckoo, um, the Anakim are quite in touch with nature. And um, a good example of that is how they keep track of time during the year and they've got it broken down to the week with a name for each week. So uh, I wanted to know more about how you went about well coming up with that and then also coming up with each of the names and the natural occurrences that coincide with that i think they're like um uh the original idea was from this like the japanese have a system of micro seasons i think which i think is like um is fortnightly for them um and i read about that ages ago and thought and it, and again it's, it's like micro seasons sort of just based on um like tiny things which happen then which i thought was so evocative like they have things like when the when the cherry blossoms turn turn pink or start to fall or whatever um and i just read it and immediately loved it and knew that's what like the anakin would would have because um <clears throat> they would especially if like so they spend a lot of time living in their big stone fortress the hindrance so they they would feel kind of constantly mildly homesick for um, the wilderness and they just want these like reminders of sort of how the year was passing. Um, so I really, that was one of the my favourite bits about writing the book was trying to come up with those little micro seasons um, which they divide the year into. And they've got things like, you know, sort of where the, when the red deer start to roar, they've got a week that's based on that or like when the crab apples turn red or like um, just like evocative stuff for the seasons. And um, it was a really good excuse for getting outside and like just um, spending as much time as possible outdoors so you could notice like, oh, you know, like um, this is the week, like mistle, mistletoe comes out or like sort of, um, there was a really good one I saw where there's this really bizarre array of ghost moths. I don't know if you have them in the States, which like um, they just do this weird like dance going up and down. And I think they're the moths which like they're born without mouths and like so they never actually eat. They like only in the larval state can they feed. And it just happens like one week every year that the ghost moths come out and start dancing. I was like, oh, it's, like that's definitely one the anarchy would have. They'd really recognize that. Um and <clears throat> coming up with the words for them, it's mostly sort of it's a combination of um uh, something that's quite onomatopoeic. So, like, I think the week that the cuckoo starts call is called like huko. So, you know, not that, um, not that different to the actual noise. And like, you're trying to actually listen to what the noise sounds like in real life. So, you know how um, in some cultures cows go like, um, if people someone's doing an impression of a cow, they go like ooh rather moo or like just sort of like kazoo or something like that. Um, and we, we've sort of like anthropomorphized the sounds which we think animals make. And so it was, a, it was a process of like trying to like listen to, actually listen properly to what animals might actually sound like when they're making those noises. And then you make them into a more kind of anakim sounding one. The anakim have quite like a plosive language. So there's lots of sort of like P's and like hard sort of like um, consonants in there. Um, so it was a kind of like blend of trying to put those together to make it sound you know uh authentically anakim well that leads neatly into my questions about in general there's a lot of anakim words and oh, names and <laughs> um so yeah uh if you want to talk about how you went about developing the other words that the anakim have um and the other influences for because like uh, the name lothbrook is in there which i don't know if you did take it from norse sagas but certainly reminded me of Norse sagas and the Kryptea is Spartan. So 
um, how you went about developing what we get of the Anakin language. Yeah, the um, I think uh, it's it's really hard to come up with words first of all, like because they always they always sound faintly ridiculous if you're just plucking them off the top of your head, and it's really obvious there's a made up word. Um, so the Anakim have like a um, I based a lot of their language on Icelandic just because I felt like that was the most um, first of it's kind of one of the most similar to old Norse um, and I felt like that is the culture which leaned nearest to what the Anakim were and in this um, <clears throat> sort of alternate version of um Europe that we've created, there's lots of kind of like different strands of um, like influence running along it. And the Norse were like heavily influenced by the Anakim. So they kind of like the southerners who are like modern humans in Erebos tried to go, they tended to go one of two ways. They either revered the Anakim and sort of treated them as gods or they became their sort of mortal enemies. And the Norse in this version more revered them and kind of started to emulate them. So that was the thinking behind treating Icelandic as the kind of like base language for them. Um, and there's, but there's different sort of strands. So like Lothbrok is one of the family names in there, which comes from that. But also there's um, the Vidar, who are like Ketura, who are one of the main characters' families, and her father is Tekoa. Um, and all their family are from more sort of Hebrew names. Um, and all of the different families and sort of tribes have different areas of Europe, basically, which their names come from, which is like reflective of where they would originally have occupied because in the sort of history of them, they originally occupied Europe as the Neanderthals did. And then when modern humans arrived, they're all condensed into the UK. So the names are like reflective of the areas which they came from originally or their families came from originally. Um, and they've got this... Uh, their language you've, I've tried to create to be like um, to show how differently they thought basically because I really like I, when I was living in this tent in the Arctic the Norwegians um, who are the people who are like most commonly around they would always like talk about how poor the English language was um, because they were thinking in a, obviously in Norwegian and then trying to translate it to English and it made no like they kept finding getting really frustrated by like words that they had but they couldn't express properly in English um, and I really I really like like that it was kind of so obvious like how differently they were thinking to me just by the fact that it was being like constrained by a different language so in the Anakin language I thought like they have to have like words which would be reflective of the way they think um, so I think you mentioned before they've got this like they've got three ways of talking about friends um, and that's partly inspired by like in Norway we've got two different ways of saying I love you You've got like Yaelskadai, which is really intense. Like apparently you'd only say that if it was like your wedding day, and even then it would be a bit cheesy. And then Yai Gladi Dai, which is like, um, <clears throat> I am glad in you. And that's much that's much milder than like our version of I love you. And because of that, they haven't got this like they haven't got the same thing we have, whereas like in a relationship you say, I love you, and that, that's a huge thing. They have a much gentler thing, which you'd say kind of quite regularly, and then like a really intense thing, which is kind of too much. Um, and in the same way, the Anakim have like three different kinds of friend, which is like um, just makes those relationships a bit more kind of like like subtle, a bit more. Um, they just think about them quite differently, um, and I think that's the way language can shape culture. I really wanted to bring that in, and that was again one of the really fun bits about writing. It was trying to like. Um, work up things that like everyone was familiar with but which we didn't have words for um so like imagine if you imagine if there was no word for deja vu um would you would we ever talk about there kind it? of isn't we start we stole that word because we didn't actually have <laughs> <laughs> um yeah do you, will we ever talk about it do you think like if we if there was no word for deja vu you'd be like oh, i had that thing where like it feels like i've had this before and i'm like oh yeah i kind of get that sometimes i suppose slang comes in sometimes to fill in those gaps when we start to uh, refer to something in a slang way because there isn't actually a word to really capture. Ooh, what do you think of? Give an example. Oh, <laughs> I feel like I don't know the, the, when people talk about how uh, you know the younger generations we never know what we're what they're saying because they're saying tons of slang things because 
they're reflective of how you speak on the internet and the way you speak on the internet references things that we haven't in the past and the way that you use emojis and the way that you use, I don't know, abbreviations of words, but the abbreviation doesn't actually mean the same thing as the full word because the abbreviation has become, has developed its own meaning by being used as slang. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's so true. That's really true. I kind of stay off the internet. So I'm like very, um, <laughs> very far from all these, these things. I'm glad you're keeping me back down to earth. <laughs> Uh, do you? Uh, I know you mentioned Icelandic and, and Norwegian, but do you speak any other like languages fluently? And then drew on that I yourself. Speak, I speak Norwegian reasonably well, but um, ev- ev- otherwise, but I was literally just from sort of pure immersion. Like I think I was absolutely hopeless at language in school. Like my French teacher would routinely pull his hair out the, out the side of me. Like it was a very stressful experience for both of us. <laughs> Well, um, speaking of inventing a language that fits how the Anna can think, um, I'm very fascinated by the concept of yeah. possession, which comes up quite a bit. Um, so I don't know if you want to explain possession and then why that became such a thing for the Anna can. So possession was like, um, uh, is their concept of of being totally overwhelmed, essentially by an emotion. Um, and... Like if if you're kind of uh, and quite often it's associated with groups. So if like if a group is like sort of there's like a general sense of rage and like outrage about like can you believe so and so did this and they're like what did they I can't believe that and so everyone like whips themselves up with this like fervor and sort of um, massive anger um, and quite often it's like unjustified and it just goes too far and it's a bit sort of unhealthy. That was part of that was like that thing about language and sort of thinking that we probably as a society haven't recognized how toxic that is and like you kind of need a proper word for that and if we had a proper word for that then maybe we would be more attuned to how bad it is um and partly it was from um partly from like seeing a wolf for the first time and like um i went to a zoo it's not like it's not a very exciting story it's like a um, but you wrote those... the wolf in the Arctic, so I had visions of you alone facing the Arctic wolf, wolf. <laughs> like the roaming around outside. Yeah, <laughs> not so much. No, it was it was it was actually um, it was actually literally just the year before, and like I gone to one of those uh, in the UK. You have those like drive through like safari things because our um, fauna is so massively unexciting, um, and instead you've got like you know like a big park you can drive through, and they've got wolves and bears and lions and things in there and I'd never actually seen a wolf in the flesh before um and I was really struck by it because um I'd expected to look like you know you see some of those like like a Siberian husky sometimes looks a bit like a wolf um and I thought it'd be like that but it was really like notably different um it was so like mature compared to a dog and so aware and like you could just every single footfall was considered and it was just it's sort of like looking in the eyes just a much more sensible character than a dog um and i've always had in my mind as the analog for what the anakim would be like is I was say, it sounds like the difference between anakim and humans the way the anakim think of humans in the book yeah completely completely i've always thought that like um <clears throat> if you because i think basically what happened to wolves when they became dogs is what happened to us when we became uh versus our like hunter-gatherer ancestors and i've always thought like the analog for an anakin is they are a wolf if we are a dog um so their concept of possession is partly that they're just a more sensible <laughs> more sensible character um and like, they're just a bit more kind of mature and a bit more like um i think less vulnerable to like flights of emotion than we are mob mentalities <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> um leading in then to something we haven't really talked about but the differences in anakim culture between how um men and women are regarded or their roles in society in the culture of the anakim how you went about doing that and why so i think this is probably one of the things i'd have i've had most questions about because um it's kind of different from most fantasy in that like women don't appear in like a fighting role particularly. Um, and I think in most fantasy now they tend to like, it's, it's probably much more frequent for women to be involved in the fighting. And I thought, um, 
I'm really not trying to create like a sort of um, utopia with the Anakin. I'm not trying to make like a sort of, uh, or, or with that world in general, <laughs> it's not supposed They're to be They're not like, right about everything. <laughs> no, no, completely. And it's, um, and actually I thought like by far the default for most societies in the world has been that women haven't really been involved in the combat side of things. And it, it was kind of their, like, um, the default position, I think, as societies have developed is that men and women are different and occupy different spheres of life. And it's only really in our society that there's, there's obviously examples of um, both overlapping. Um, but it's only really in our we're moving them sort of closer and closer in our society than I think has been, than is like certainly typical of the norm across like cultures. Um, and I think it would, it probably marks a book out as being quite distinctly of our age and time. If like the number of women fighters that there are, like um, certainly like loads of societies did have women fighters. Um, well, so since you took inspiration from the Norse, uh, they certainly yeah, have shield maidens. Shield maidens, things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, but overall, it's definitely been a kind of, um, it's been more, the preserve of men and I think it's that women warrior thing has been well explored by like fancy books um before and I and that was actually it was quite a deliberate thing trying not to make it a utopia um and to make it kind of notably and like alienly different from what we have now um because I really didn't want people to think I was creating something which was like I, I think if, if I think if it all been too nice and too like familiar and similar, then I it gets a bit, um, I don't know, a bit, a bit unbelievable. Do you know what I mean? Like a bit yeah. less real. Like I think I think the fact of him, there's like this thing fears is like is gritty and like it's it's probably more believable from an ancient society than like um, something that's more kind of uh, more recognisable to us, I guess. Was that something you came to as you wrote? Because, I mean, if there was Norse inspiration, I could see very easily just kind of like going with the like, well, we'll have shield maidens then because they did too. And that's a, you know, or did did you always know you're like, no, I'm, that's definitely not something I'm doing with the Anakim? Um, that's a really good question. I think, I think actually in the original version I wrote when I was 12, there were female warriors. And as um, I started developing I started looking for more and more ways to like I was I sort of got a bit I was more like they're a bit similar to the Norse at the moment and we just we need to actually like <laughs> veer off a bit. Um, so I think in the original version there were some um, but also partly doing kind of more anthropology as well I, I think like I think it is much more common to have a pretty clear distinction between the roles of men and the roles of women mm -hmm. and um, originally as well when I wrote the book there wasn't the academy which is like this uh, sisterhood of historians which is quite a big um role which and like a very important role which the women fulfill in this <coughs> society and I, I felt like that sort of um created more like an easier division between like what men and women did which I think which I think is kind of probably more typical of like and particularly the anarchy are a very like insular and very conservative society and that uh, those kind of studies seem to prefer like clean breaks between stuff, or, like not blurred categories. Um, so that was another reason I thought like they'd have like very clear like this is what men do and this is like this is what women do. Yeah, I mean for anyone that hasn't read the books, I don't want to make it sound like women are second class citizens in in these books. They they certainly are very prominently featured and and powerful, just in a very different sphere of life. Um, so. It, you don't become powerful in a story just because you wield a sword. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, and I'm kind of I'm a bit bored at the narrative as well. I like think like the only way you can show that someone is really cool is because they're really good at fighting. Like I find that, I yeah, <laughs> I find that mildly sexist. I guess I was gonna say as a woman, I do get tired of strong female characters being strong because they're just men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I find that well. So it is re in in some respects refreshing not to have women warriors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i don't know if it uh segues neatly but uh next i wanted to talk about characters um 
And I didn't actually have Katera on my list because I don't really, I don't feel that I have questions about her. I think she's so well written. She is one of the most uh, prominently featured female characters in it. Um, I found <laughs> as a quick aside that my favorite professors at university, I never wanted to go to their office hours because I never had questions for them because everything was clear from lecture. And I was like, I would love to speak to you more, but I don't have anything to ask you. I understand yeah. everything. Yeah. Oh, that's so, perfect. Great. Yeah, so I guess I'm only asking about characters that <laughs> something wasn't clear to me. You're not so sure about. So Bella, actually, Katura is one of the. She's one of the easiest ones to write, and like, um, uh, she's actually she is one of the most of them you don't base or I I don't base at all on like um, people I know from real life. But she and it's her and Figtear really who are like um, based almost entirely on people I did actually know. Um, and Katura is very is very easy because she's just a friend from school who um, I just every time I imagine what Katura would say I sort of obviously like they've diverged quite a lot since then but like her origin was like and her mannerisms and kind of like her sense of humor and things I just imagine like what she would say um, and that was like just a very easy way of writing and it started with a really kind of like complete sense of like what she'd like and what she wouldn't like and yeah made life a lot easier. <laughs> Do the, I think it's a compliment to whoever, you know, was your inspiration for Katura. But does the person who inspired Victor know that he no. actually inspired Victor? <laughs> no. no Victor is also actually, he was a really good friend. Um, but he's a very, uh, uh, he's a very driven and like mildly tormented character. Um, not nearly as much as Victor, I'm pleased to say. But um, uh, I he him I just found quite fascinating and like his sort of mannerisms and things. I was just like, there needs to be someone like you. Well, I did not expect that. <laughs> um, but so I, I first on my list was actually a Bellamis because he's the most kind of the the character that is utilized to bring in like more open conversation about anthropological concepts. So like he is kind of the anthropologist in the story, at least how I interpreted him. But he is. Um, the antagonist and was that always the intention um, or was he ever the protagonist or um, no Bellamus is like he's moved steadily towards the uh, being more of a protagonist and less of an antagonist so when I did the original 12 year old version he was purely a villain he was just like a sort of um, just a really nasty enemy to like mustache work. twirling yeah, completely. Yeah, wore a cape. I think it was like um, surrounded by evil henchmen, and used to like routinely stab his friends in the back and things like that. And um, as we, as I rewrote the book, and I, I think Bellibus kind of inherited a lot of what I would have liked to have been doing had I been confronted with the Anakin. Like I would have loved to like gone and explore that society and like sort of found out more about them. Um, and actually, weirdly, he's probably even though he is basically the villain. Uh, he's probably one of the characters I relate most to. Like, I really understand his motivations. I really... And I loads of people say, like, oh, I hate Bellamus. Um, and... Uh, I, I don't hate Bellamus, but I have heard that a lot from people who read it. Yeah, I have a friend yeah. who... I think she wanted... She keeps asking me for spoilers for the series because she hasn't finished it yet. And she mm -hmm. wanted to know... Uh, wanted me to confirm that Bellamus gets, like, uh, drawn and quartered. And I was like, well... <laughs> <laughs> gets his comeuppance yeah i know i was a bit like i was actually a bit surprised by that because when i um even when i wrote this version he's the antagonist but he sort of i quite sympathize with him up until uh the cuckoo when he sort of diverges a little bit from what i think was acceptable but he up until that point i thought he was like um uh fine actually and i think you can really understand what he's done from the positions he's been put in like he's he is definitely the person i like related to the most um he definitely makes some like poor decisions because he becomes isolated in the cuckoo um and he the path he's on sort of leads him to like steadily going diverging further and further from his friends and so he's got fewer people to draw him back down to reality which i think is what he he needs um but yeah weird, weirdly yeah, he started much more moustache twirling, as you say, and and then he became basically sort of, uh, he was more of like an audience surrogate. So like a sort of way you could experience the Anakin and like sort of how you might know more about them. 
But making the um, audience surrogate the antagonist is a bold choice. <laughs> yeah, a strange maneuver. Um, that, that was, again, quite sort of organic because he started as when I rewrote this, like this final version, he was kind of quite neutral. Um, and him and Roper just sort of steadily ended up <clears throat> intertwining. They weren't supposed to be kind of, they've ended up as like arch enemies, basically. But they weren't supposed to be initially. They were just supposed to be sort of, um, they rub alongside each other, but aren't really um, opposites. And they do end up being opposites. And that was just sort of one of those ways that the story develops and like um i had loads of ideas starting out about how i wanted it to end but um sometimes it just sort of rides itself and you find yourself moving in a slightly different direction certainly was there did you ever have any concerns about writing a series where you're asking humans to root against humans <laughs> um no actually because i i think that's quite quite common now like sort of especially with like environmental movements and things everyone's everyone's a bit like fed up of people aren't they like um there's a lot of us and we sort of seem to do a lot of damage and things like and for the record i don't actually think that's um those aren't the views i i share but um there's definitely like an underlying sort of particularly with the eco movement and things like there's certainly times when i um i am really 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 do love wilderness and sort of being in those kind of places and there's certainly times when I'm like, i just wish like there was more of this, like a bit less sort of busyness and like um, urbanness and things like that. And I, I think there is quite a strong sentiment of that in the general population as well. And I think it's actually not that difficult to get people to to think like, well, it'd be quite nice if we were a bit more in tune with the wild and kind of holding might go up to some of our less admirable qualities. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's hard to root for the anarchism against people. I just think as a you know, if you're you're addressing the the company's board and about what story you're going to be pitching to the populace and say, so the the villains are the humans. I feel like <laughs> the the decision yeah. makers be like, mm, we're not sure if people are going to go for that. <laughs> yeah, like, have you thought about this? Actually, it's the the ending is actually the bit which is like um, we won't go to that because I imagine we'll say that for the spoiler section. But that's the bit which has, was difficult to convince the board about. <laughs> trying to run that by my head he was like are you sure <laughs> <laughs> um going back a little bit um I'm, i don't think there would be too much to say about this but maybe you'll surprise me um but the character of gray and his sort of personal arc and personal goals and journey about overcoming death and overcoming fear of death um where did that come from um so there's some like it's I think it's always really funny when you're like uh when you're a kid and tiny things can like your your brain is so small, right? Like that tiny things can like take up a huge percentage of it. And um I find that did you ever watch Blackadder? Do you know Blackadder? That was um that was quite a big part of my childhood, weirdly. And um that was the reason I went to Cambridge, for example, because they keep making jokes about Oxford. So I was like, right, I've got to go to Cambridge. Um and it was the same. There was, used to be an audiobook of Blackadder where um, there's, in Blackadder Goes Forth, there's a really moving scene at the end of that where um, they all charge over the top um, and everyone ends up dying in no man's land. And as a, I remember listening to that as I must have been about like probably five or six years old um, and hearing that bit and being like, oh my God, like one day I'm going to die and it's going to be terrifying. Um, and also think, cause at the time I really wanted to be a soldier as well. So, um, I was thinking like, how on earth do you marry those two things together? Like the knowledge of death and like, and the fact of wanting to be a soldier and kind of, it just seemed the most like impossible and like terrifying things to confront at that age. Um, and I've just gray sort of like obsession with it is it's partly that partly just that I've been thinking about like that took up a tiny part of my like quite a large part of my brain is quite a small person. And then it takes up about the same percentage now that I'm just thinking about that, or I was thinking about that quite a lot and sort of <clears throat> what you do about that, like how I think it's something we don't explore that much as a society. And it's part gray, gray's like attitude is partly how I feel like it's this elephant in the room, which people aren't really talking about. Um, and I quite like to know how to like deal with that when you get there. And part of it is about, um gray some of the characters had their like origins in historical figures so roper when i was like trying to decide what his character would be 
Um, I based him on an explorer called Ernest Shackleton, um, <clears throat> who is like, uh, he's sort of probably morally fairly dubious, but like he is like, he was a brilliant, brilliant leader. Um, and like famously outrageous in a tight spot. He was the person you wanted to be commanding you, basically. Um, and there was another explorer called Bill Wilson, who um, <clears throat> was on one of Captain Scott's expeditions. Um, and Bill Wilson was like famous for being morally like very upright. Like um, he was a really high, highly regarded member of one of the expeditions originally to get to the South Pole. And um, he had written to his sister, like, um, I think 10 years before he died, saying he was fascinated by the concept that someone might fit, like transcend fear of death and kind of not be worried about it. Um, and Wilson uh, ended up dying with Captain Scott on the way back from the South Pole. Sorry for that's a spoiler for um and scott wrote like a letter it says, so this is his leader who he died with in a in a sort of tent and they, they all knew they were going to die on the way back and um scott wrote a letter to uh wilson's wife saying he'd seen him face death and like he was just completely calm and like sort of <clears throat> fine about it in the same way wilson wrote a letter to his wife as well which is still one of the most moving things i've ever read um, and I was just really inspired by um, the fact that he'd he decided to try and like take on death and like uh, without fear when it came, and he did get to do that, and he did succeed in it. Um, so I guess it was a combination of the two. Um, but Gray ultimately, when I was doing his kind of mannerisms um, and like what he believed in, the starting point was Bill Wilson from. Uh, one of Scott's expeditions. Sorry, that was slightly dark. I was going to say, like I said, I thought you wouldn't have much to say about that one and then ended up being fast. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> That's just how it goes. Um, I hope there's more upbeat for your next question. I feel like you just answered, I think, two of my questions, which were, was anyone inspired from real life or history? So we know your friends and Shackleton and the uh, Wilson. And then you might have already answered who your favorite character is if it's Bellamis, um, or who you most identify with certainly is Bellamis. I think my, my favorite character is probably Roper. Um, is Bellamis but... who you are and Roper's who you wish to be? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think probably. Um, I think uh, I always, like, and I've always thought of um, Price as, like, Price and Grey are the sort of angel and the, like, demon on my shoulders. Grey is, like, sort of who I sort of would like to aspire to be. And, like, in my kind of more sober moment, I do aspire to be, like. And then Price is, like, when I feel a bit reckless, he's kind of, he's the, like, tempting. Like, go on, like, be a bit of a dick. Like, you know, be slightly more kind of up yourself and, like, a bit more strive for glory type thing. Um, so that was <clears throat> that was Price's origin as well, that he was, like, who I would like to aspire to be like in my worst moments, basically. They're kind of like opposite of Grey, basically. Okay, but they work really well together as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. A duo. Opposite the track, I suppose. So I think you've, you've kind of like touched on your writing process and, and the fact that you came up with it in broad concept at 12, but you know, obviously like fleshed it out a lot more um, much later on and anthropology came into it um but when you did sit down to write the series now properly um did you kind of have an outline in mind of how this whole arc would go and and what were the main things that you wanted to do with it or did you just kind of write <laughs> i it was very um i knew exactly how i wanted it to end um which is the ending you see in the cuckoo um right from the start and i think again actually that probably comes from that Blackadder thing um, of like wanting to explore that, and also just being a lot like a lot of it was just being really like uh, contradictory, like um, and a bit alternative because um, I don't know if we're onto like the spoiler section here yet or not. But um, most most books and most series, the good guys always win, don't they? And, like um, you read you read like James Bond expecting. Um, 
just knowing he's going to get out and just having to work out why. And I quite wanted to write something where that wasn't the case because it's not always the case. And like, um, what I really wanted to, was to create something which was reflective of real life rather than just sort of playing to like standard narrative tropes. Um, and it felt like a really good challenge to try and um, try and do that whilst preparing the reader for it and making it <clears throat> so that it wasn't such a horrible shock and didn't feel like an unnatural conclusion to all it when it came. Um, I have absolutely no idea if I, if I succeed in that. But it was, it just, it was a really like, it was quite an inspiring challenge. And that was the point I knew we were trying to go for in the end. And also, cause I like, I'm slightly, I think probably like, again, like I was very interested in those whole like heroic age of exploration stories when I was younger and the concept of heroic failure and um, <clears throat> Scott like, dying on the way back from the South Pole and things like that. And uh, <clears throat> wanted to explore that cause it is, uh, they are incredible stories and it is really common in human experience like to try really hard, like as hard as you possibly can at something and still fail and not succeed. And so often people do get what they want in these books. And um, I didn't feel that was reflective of what always happened. So that was definitely what I wanted to end up at. Um, <clears throat> and then the rest of the books really sort of were kind of groping towards that and like trying to um trying to find a way of getting there but kind of not too prescriptively and like writing something which narratively made sense and um <clears throat> was true to the characters along the way but because it was set up with them all heading towards this destination at the beginning um i felt like it was true to the characters and partly like gray's exploration of like the meaning of life and kind of death and things was a way of preparing the reader for what was going to happen at the end of the cookbook. Well, I'll put spoiler warnings around this section if we want to just talk <laughs> about the ending right now. <laughs> yeah, the ending right now yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, one of my questions in the spoiler section, obviously the first one is, did you know that from, from when you started that everyone would die? Um, at least almost everyone um, on the Anakin side. So that, yeah. I, yes, you did. But did you ever along the way go, maybe I won't, maybe... Maybe I won't. I don't care them. <laughs> I, the, the only reason I was tempted to do it was because um, editors at various points have been like the board. <laughs> yeah, could you could you dial that down just a little bit, like um, and like uh, Takoa dies at the uh, dies in the sort of final battle scene, um, and he's one of my favorite characters, probably. And um, he's a, he's actually like he's not based on my dad, but. Um, <laughs> Lots of his, lots of what he says, like particularly the most unreasonable and amusing bits, are based on like lines of dialogue from my dad. And um, uh, loads of people were like, <clears throat> "Please, can we just keep him alive? Like, sort of have him come back at the end, or some of that." And it is, it is really tempting to have a sort of um, uh, just like have those, like explore the possibility that those people might have survived and like be able to write books about them again um but i think that cheapens it and like ultimately the kind of temptation to do that was only really fleeting um and, the way that it uh, ends i feel like it's either all or nothing yeah i think so and it was um i think it just undermines the kind of what i was trying to get at if people it would it, like i can't really i can't really imagine how else it would have ended because that had been like so clearly what I was trying to get at the whole way through um even if that wasn't entirely obvious the goal like the goal when writing the trilogy was to make it so that like it was sort of like uh good stories that you could read on their own but then by the time you got to that ending it hadn't made you like absolutely know that that's where it was going but neither were you completely shocked that like that was the ultimate outcome I guess well, speaking for myself, I mean, I would, I, yeah, I mean, I think it is set up and I, I, it didn't feel impossible that that's how it would end, but it was still devastating to read. I cried for like 10 minutes after finishing the cuckoo, <laughs> but it's I still, wouldn't I, change the ending. I think it's a good ending. I think it's, it's very like unusual. I haven't, I haven't read a book where like that happens necessarily before. Um, and I mean, if the cuckoo had ended more happily where some of our heroes made it, or even if the Anakin won, I think it would still be a fantastic book, but I don't think it would have 
really stayed with me the way that it has. I mean, I say erect me, but in I guess the best <laughs> possible way. I think readers are masochists at their core. Yeah. Oh, oh good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's. I was also trying to find a way of doing that, which didn't um, just feel totally hopeless and nihilistic. Um, and I think p- that's part of the reason like, why sort of Ketera like, is able to found her society and there's a little like, germ of hope at the end there. Um, and part, part of it was also about trying to have made, I guess, um, ideals more important than like, um, or like really important things to throughout the course of the narrative so that like, <clears throat> even when they die, it's not necessarily um, the greatest failure because that wasn't really the objective. We veered into another, like, in more dark territory here. You must have some more cheerful questions. I was going to say, you wrote the books. You know how dark they are. <laughs> I mean, I was going to go try to try to get back to writing approach, but my next question was about battle <laughs> and war. Oh, yeah. Um, sure, yeah. Okay. There is a lot of, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of very clever things that well, both sides <clears throat> get up to. Um, so, I don't know, just coming up with those situations and coming up with those strategies and, and writing them in a way also where, in particular, um, trying to crawl back away from spoilers again for a second but i mean what what roper does in in the wolf you know is very to to keep that from the reader so it's a surprise that there's a lot of of uh, creativeness in battle and war so um i assume you haven't led any armies so (laughs) where did this come from uh historical fiction and uh genuine historic history as well have been particularly the genuine history have been like really good source of inspiration for it um, people have had thousands of years to think up really cutting ways to um, like pull the rug out from each other's feet. <clears throat> and I think um, ro- what Roper does in trying to get back into the Hindran is, um, I think it was originally from a civil war in Roman times um, uh, between Marius and Sulla, um, which I remember reading about and thinking like, oh, that's a really like, I didn't see that coming cool at all. That's a really cool trick. Well, it was a um, bit Trojan War Horse esque as well. Yeah, it's very, it's very Trojan War, isn't it? And the same with like, um, uh, oh, it's, if we're trying to stay away from spoilers, I would say. But basically, like most of it has its like. Um, oh, go ahead. I'll just tag it a spoilery as well. Or <laughs> uh, well, Katura's poisoning was based on, I can't remember who, I think it was like the Russian. It was like a sort of Eastern European states prime minister who publicly criticized Putin or something. And um, he was, I think, progressively poisoned. And um, uh, yeah, it came from that, like the concept of sort of poisoning someone to try and like weaken them rather than necessarily to kill them, just to make them look feeble and like less appealing. Um, but yeah, basically, like if you, it's, there's so much inspiration from history, like people have, been screwing each other over for years so yeah yeah (laughs) that's unfortunately true and then as cliche as as it is um who are your favorite authors and did you take any inspiration not just i mean from obviously historical fiction is an inspiration for actual battle tactics but in in writing um favorite authors i really love bernard cornwall who have you ever read bernard cornwall not yet, but I think I'm about to very soon. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, uh, well, they're like The Last Kingdom. He does a really good series on um, uh, Viking Britain and kind of the Viking invasions of Britain. Um, the Sharp as well, which is, um, who's a rifleman in the Napoleonic Wars, which I think is probably the reason I'm in the army now, because I just read those and really love them. It's tragic how much of my life appears to have been inspired from just reading books that I liked, isn't it, really? Um, hey, well, I think... Uh... The American Archaeological Association gave an award to um, Harrison Ford for inspiring so many people to want to become archaeologists. Really? Yeah. Really? I can imagine, actually. That's so true. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, well, well archaeology was part of my original degree, so becoming Indiana Jones was definitely on the to-do list after finishing that. I can really imagine that. Um, and actually, on the same note, one of my absolute favourite authors is Philip Pullman, who... Um, you know, wrote the Golden Compass, I think it's called in the US, and like um, uh, the Suffering Northern Lights. Yeah, yeah, Northern Lights, exactly. And that um, 
that again I think is why I ended up living in a tent in the Arctic um, <laughs> it was in Northern Lights lots of it set in Svalbard um, and Svalbard was where I was living um, and it was only really after I got there that I was like sort of I was like hang on a minute um, I've tried to become an explorer I've moved to Svalbard my favorite drink is Tokai um, I live in a narrow boat like the Egyptians who are in the book like I've tragically based my life off the golden compass basically um and yeah Philip Horton particularly particularly that book I just absolutely love um <clears throat> did you write some other really good ones as well um uh what is that? Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell you read that one yeah I love I it really, really enjoyed that book and I particularly the audio book um what's the author called Susanna Clark Susanna Clark yeah yeah um really love that and like the sense of like I really tried to bring some of that to the wolf like the sense of kind of genuine history because it's like a pastiche isn't it of like an 18th century well, history, about history yeah yeah exactly two gentlemen magicians and like it's, it borrows both from the real world and kind of from how things might have changed if there had been magic during that period um and I really like that and like it just it was so convincingly executed um and they're like the way it was so realistic and like grounded magic and like a sort of academic discipline. Um, if I may, my favorite recommendation for people who like that book is the Declaration of the Rights of Magicians. Oh, what's that? Um, it's very similar where it's an alternate history, but so instead of, um, so it's during sort of like abolitionist era, but so introducing the idea of magic and so that it's the right to use magic that's being debated. Um, and so we have like Wilberforce in it as a character and, um, Robespierre as a character, and oh, yeah. but it's it's an alternate history where there's magic. Oh, fantastic! What was that called? Dec Declaration of the Rights of Magicians. Oh, I'll try and read that. <laughs> the world will credits left to use up. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, no, um, those are probably the main ones. But yeah, very good. Um, well, for future writing, I know um, my original question uh, was if you plan to come back to this world and these characters or other parts of the map, perhaps, but also if you have plans to write maybe something, I mean, this is speculative insofar as it's an alternate history, but something more like, you know, Philip Pullman wrote where there's there's magic or Susanna Clark where there is magic. Is it something that you've uh, thought about writing? Yeah, definitely. I think the um, what I probably am going to write next is historical fiction like more pure historical fiction with um i've been reading a lot about the aztecs recently like um uh the arrival of the sort of conquistadors in the new world which i think is just such a like such an amazing story um i just really really want to try and do a sort of convincing version and the aztecs is is like it's a bit like the anakin and it's such a kind of profoundly weird society to us from like our perspective I would really love to like be able to kind of put yourselves in some Aztec shoes and just sort of um, work out how that would be and like tell it from their perspective and like see what it would have been like to have the conquistadors land in the new world. I really love to do that. But then after that, doing like a sort of um, series with some proper magic and like kind of probably like a better thought out um, uh, like system of magic. Like I really like. <clears throat> have you read King Killer Chronicles? And you know that, like the system of magic they've got there, the sympathy thing, um, I thought was brilliant. Actually, like really well thought out, and I really loved that kind of like grounding in um, reality. So something kind of a little bit <clears throat> inspired by that is like very appealing. We need to go a lot more thought. Would you want it to also be in a kind of academic setting, like it is in the King Killer Chronicle? Mm, it's a good question. Um, it is fun, though, isn't it? Like the concept of sort of wizard school and things, and like. It's a very yeah. successful formula. I was going to say that um, it, it lends itself to writing because like having the system of like people who have a reason to be together and a reason to be learning something that the audience would need to learn. I think there's something great as well about being able to aspire towards the kind of like you've got the kind of head teacher type model of like the people who are really good and accomplished at this discipline. And that gives you immediately something to aim for, like these people who are kind of amazingly powerful. And there's something universal about that thing of like building slowly towards um being really good at something and looking up to people who've kind of appeared to have it all and have done it so well the mentor wizard um, yeah exactly <laughs> um which like a a school setting really lends itself towards doesn't it 
Yeah, and then of course there's bullies and rivalries, and everyone's together oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah, very juicy. And you get Same to song. write more songs. I did like all the songs. In in uh, have you? Do you have melodies in mind? This is not on my list, but did you have melodies in mind for the songs you wrote for the Anakin? I did actually. <laughs> they all they're all sets of melodies in my head, um, like existing. You should melodies. have told your narrator to sing them then. <laughs> I know, I know. I think that's, I thought that's very my embarrassment, to be honest. Um, but the uh, actually writing the songs is my absolute least favorite bit of writing the books. Um, you could you have can, not you, done it then if you didn't want to. I know. Well, but I thought that looked like a massive cop out because you can either say like they then proceeded to like sing a traditional Anakin song, um, which sounds lazy and is, um, or you can like. You have to make up the song, like it has to sound at least mildly convincing. Um, so those were bits which took by far the longest, and I hated the most because they were just like, I have no talent for writing songs. So like, <clears throat> so were the, the melodies point. just melodies you already knew that you kind of like wrote words to go to match? Yeah, exactly. Like Christmas carols and like <laughs> the Anakin going caroling. That's a yeah. <laughs> story that you should write. <laughs> it's a bit less blood curdling, isn't it? When you imagine it sung to like Good King Wenceslas. <laughs> No, I really want to see the Anakin caroling. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, going properly into spoilers very quickly, because I know we're running short on time. Mm -hmm. um, but so you already addressed the poison and the fact that you knew everyone was going to um, end up dead. <laughs> um, but so the the smallpox blankets, essentially, that Bella misuses, um, when did it occur to you to use that element and how did you go about developing that? Uh, that was like, I think like with most characters, which were like combination of lots of different things and behaviors you've seen in different people. That was a combination of lots of different um, factors. One of them was um, again, like looking at history and like the fact that people did used to be really dastardly with plague and like, um, used to deliberately try and like expose enemies to the plague so that their armies would sort of weaken from disease. Like that's been used for absolute ages <clears throat> and is a particularly like, kind of horrible weapon, which I think gets touched on probably relatively little in like um, historical fiction. It doesn't seem to come up very much. Um, well, it's more fun to write battle than sick beds. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Like, <laughs> more, it's, nobody talks about all the dysentery in the dark ages, do they? Um so I wanted to bring a little bit, a little slice of dysentery. Um, and another one was reading an article which suggested that uh, disease played a really large part in uh, Neanderthal and human um, interactions and particularly the extinction of the Neanderthals who were less well adapted to dealing with certain diseases. Um, and that actually some of the Neanderthal genome that we carry may make us less um uh, more vulnerable to certain diseases, which you know suggests that you you really can have. Um, I, like I always I always imagine like if you the Neanderthals and humans how like close they are together, uh, humans and Anakin would have been much much further apart. Um, so they would have diverged a lot longer ago than humans and Neanderthals. So you definitely could I think have a disease which would affect the Anakin, but not <coughs> people. Um, and then finally, the actual disease itself, I modelled on SARS, basically, the um, uh, initial like SARS outbreak, just because I like I did find, I think SARS is objectively quite scary. Um, if you think about it, it had like a 10% mortality rate and it kind of made it quite a long way. Um, and it was just sort of the nearest, I think it had to be a respiratory virus to like enable it to travel effectively. Um, and it's all, like I say, like, I think making things more like real life makes them kind of, um, more evocative and like, it's much easier to kind of imagine yourself, um, or imagine that situation unfolding if you can like ground it in something real. Um, did so you yeah. ever consider having the Anakim use the biological weapon against humans rather than humans using biological weapons against the Anakim? I think the probably not just because the Anakim had enough weapons of their own, like because they were so. It would be beneath um, them to do something so cowardly. I think it would be. And I, I think they're too, like. Um, the Cryptea would do it, though. The Cryptea might well do it, but they, I think all of them are just, they're so aloof that it wouldn't occur to them that they'd lose. So they'd all just be like, we don't, we don't need to resort to all this. Like, 
not going to be you. Um, and it was more a way of sort of, it's a sneaky way for Bellamist to even the odds. I don't think anyone else would have been desperate enough to come up with it, basically. Even he was uh, hesitant about using it, and then it sort of went out of his hands. Yeah, I think that's probably the bit where Bellis, Bellamist and I diverge slightly. Because but... you wouldn't hesitate to use biological weapons? Oh, yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be all over it. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't, what was, uh, oh, I have lots of questions, but I had one in mind after that. But anyway, um, oh, um, speaking of the Cryptea, they're so determined to defeat or to, to stop Roper that they would help Bellamis. Um, uh, which I don't not and I wasn't surprised about. That. I guess I was surprised about it. I just feel like there's you know there's a difference between on your own side saying we don't like what our side is doing, let's put a stop to it on our team. But to go so far as to say it's better to have our enemy win than to have our currently tyrannical mm. leader succeed. Um, why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, there's a couple of things there. First of all, that. Roper had left them very few other ways of acting. Like he'd sort of by uh, turning people publicly against um, the cryptia, he had um, made it impossible for them to like function the way they usually did. And that I like just trying to put myself in like the shoes of the cryptia felt like you get a lot of mission creep, don't you? Like you're told to do something and you slightly lose sight of the fact that hang on, like is this necessary? Is this like going to <clears throat> really help or make things better. Um, and from their perspective, they've just got this kind of centuries long rivalry with the institution of the stone throne and like the black Lord. And um, they just have to, they have to beat him. And like, they've been like publicly schooled by him and their institution is basically destroyed if they allow Roper to win. So in their heads, they're justifying the fact that like, we'll, we'll like help the Southerners for a bit um, because it'll sort of, we're using them basically, and they're sort of like Yokel is going through the the leader of the crypt here is going through the phases of um, justifying in his own head that like he can use them for a little bit and like they are serving him, um, but it would only be temporarily. And then as soon as like order is restored in the Black Kingdom, they have like a monarch who's more happy to do their bidding, then they can resume business as usual. Um, they believe they I, can control the One Ring and they can just use it a little bit for good. Exactly. That's really good analogy. Exactly. Like, um, it's just you're tempted and like you haven't got anything else you can do. So, in the absence of like anything plausible, you do something rather than like, you know. Um, well, I think uh, speaking of realism in real life, I think characters that always behave logically are unrealistic. So, there is a kind of cognitive dissonance, I feel, in the the way that they get their mandate, you know, through the flip of the coin. And the coin is not saying that Roper's in the wrong. They are not getting their mandate that he's in the wrong, but they continue to pursue, you know, working against him, to going so far as to help the Southerners. So, I mean, the way that they justify their own actions to themselves. Yeah, I, I think it's totally believable that they would, but it's it's interesting that they never had the coin flip to justify what they're doing. Yeah. And part of that's obviously like that whole kind of um, uh, religious the Anikimon, like how they kind of differ so much to their God, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and just that they, um, they're also highly hierarchical. So like, I think in their minds, the concept of destroying a head of state is so kind of like apocalyptic that they need to have some element of chance in which like God could make his will known. Um, because otherwise they they just wouldn't be able to do it. It'd be too sort of it'd be too huge. Um, and then, well, so the Cryptea do get their hands on Roper, even though they don't get the say so from the Almighty. But do you feel that the book would have ended differently? The story would have gone differently if they had not captured Roper, if he had been able to continue. Um, Is that well, the thing well, that made the difference? Yeah, I, I mean, like obviously, as um, as we've discussed, I think like. <clears throat> That's always how I wanted the book to end. But um, I think Roper was probably a good enough leader that he could have potentially have um, worked out a way of defeating the, the Southerners. And like, especially in that kind of early time, just before they'd finished their like properly taking control of what remained of Sustal, I think like if he had been left on the throne, I speculate that he'd probably have finished the job. So um, since you decided that the Anakim have to lose, is that 
partway through writing the cuckoo, you were like, well, the only way the Anakin can lose is if I get rid of Roper. So let me go ahead and get rid of Roper. Yeah. <laughs> is that kind of what happened? Roper's a bit of a cheat code. Really. <laughs> He's a bit of a cheat code. You sort of need to have him out the way to um, <laughs> make it fair. And then, well, the idea to get rid of him, but not fully, to have him still come back at the end. Um, I don't know, were there different versions where you were like, Roper was never gone and he was just there and they still lost, or that Roper was actually dead um, in the beginning of the book and he never comes back? <clears throat> there, were, there were definitely versions where he never left. Um, and what I really wanted was for, I think it got sort of, it got difficult for other people to take the spotlight narratively um and i sort of want i needed some time for kind of ropers i'd always had it in mind that ropers it was going to be a much longer series originally so i always had it in mind that ropers brothers were going to grow how up much and, longer uh well like decades but it was just how long it was going to take to to like tell all that um so I always had in mind that the ending would feature sort of Ropa's brothers. And um, it also seemed like Katura was a much better ruler than him. And also it felt like she needed her like shot at actually being in control. And there was something about that thing. It's sort of like Ropa's obsessed with the concept of heroism and like that leading everyone else into a mess, which is what it does. Um, well, they work again, in balance for each other. So apart yeah, from the... Uh... Yeah combination they worked they would have worked really well um but he ultimately overreaches himself and kind of has that like um mentality of like if there's a will there's a way and um that does like that does drive people through some incredible things and like it does pay off a lot of the time but also a lot of the time it doesn't um that <laughs> it's a gamble partly, yeah it's definitely a gamble that's partly what the story is about like that actually you can you can sit around and like dissect who's one and why um until the cows come home but it's not necessarily there's no not necessarily a rhyme or reason to it like sometimes you get unlucky um sometimes you've done everything you could have done right and you've just picked the wrong fight um and it's, it's about like that kind of uh that like randomness to to the world which we don't really like like we like to imagine that sort of humanity will overcome and like um uh yeah, if there's a will, there's a way, but sometimes probably not Did the case. you intend the sort of final battle in the wolf to be foreshadowing the end of the series? Because the arguably Anakin would have lost if not for the fortuitous lightning strike. So if it wasn't for the Almighty saying give lending a helping hand, they would have lost much sooner. Um do you know that so there were like that was based partly on like again, there was like a historic battle where there was a lightning strike and um I thought that was quite a cool thing because it was again like shows exactly like shows the randomness of warfare and kind of you know sometimes it's just not your day. Um and partly it was to preserve um the rivalry between Roper and Bellamus because you had I I knew like as soon as they ended up fighting each other that you had to have a way of the battle ending without and leaving one of their reputations intact. And it's like I always had in mind um you know the Battle of Waterloo where it was like um, Wellington and Napoleon had been these like big, these massive military geniuses who'd never actually fought each other. And then it's like an unbelievable comeback story that Napoleon bizarrely comes back and they have one final fight to decide the fate of Europe. Um, I had that in my mind, but like actually what I needed was for Roper and Bellibus to go off and develop their own reputations further and further. So by the time they actually meet each other for real, it's a big thing. And the lightning strike enabled me to get both of them out of that battle without their reputation being destroyed. Um, so it still leaves the question of like who would actually win when it comes down to it. In a fair fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not there is such a thing. Exactly. So it kind of, it like, you know, it was like a because I knew we we're heading towards that final battle, it was like a way of building up the hype for that, basically. Um that's the plan. Well, I know I asked this and I know you said you didn't really intend for them to be sort of arch enemies and rivals, but they, they very much are by the end. So I, they reminded me kind of of Holmes and Moriarty. Um, and then Roper goes over a cliff, much like uh, Sherlock Holmes. Um, is that why 
Roper seemed to go off a cliff and because you know there's different ways to have him potentially appear to be dead. So I don't know if that was an yeah. influence at all. Yeah, it's it's actually partly um it's partly a way of, of solving the problem of like uh so that there's no body that they can inspect very closely initially at least. Um and so and partly because it's quite difficult to do a death dramatically because it's such a it's such a final thing to, to write. So like um and like there's nothing that's really more like shocking or like terrifying in my mind than like falling off a cliff. So it wasn't like a conscious um, echo of the writing back fall, but it was. Uh, it's. I just think it's a really dramatic way of going out, and because you're like, it's such a like big narrative rug pull at that time in the book. You do want it to be as like kind of like hard hitting as possible, and I feel like falling off a cliff is just such a visual way to die and such an impossible way thing to survive that um, that had to be the way to go. <laughs> that certainly was dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a ton of more, much more detailed, specific, nuanced little questions, but I don't know, Roper going over a cliff is a probably quite a good place to end, <laughs> a good ending point. Um, but thank you so much for speaking with me about some of my all-time favorite books. Picking your brain about it is uh, just a treat. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughtful questions. Like it's really good to be able to join you. Go. Oh. My absolute pleasure. <laughs> but yeah, everyone, if you haven't already, um, if you're still here, I don't know how I'm going to tag spoilers, but if you're able to be here and not have read the books, then I'm obviously encouraging you to read them immediately. They're fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Ooh.